Well, let's go and get started. Absolutely. Um, let me go ahead and open in prayer, and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your investment in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for redeeming our lives and being our Father. And I just ask that your Spirit, your Holy Spirit, will be with us tonight. I pray for every family member that's here and watching on YouTube, Lord, that you will bless their families, that what is said will transform the family dynamics in such a beautiful way. And we'll give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Amen. Amen. Well, this is the fourth one. Wow, who would have thought? Um, so tonight, I just I'm going. To, there's quite a bit of review, and then I'm going to get real specific on the discipline aspect. But I really wanted to be open for you to ask questions and make it personal to your own family situations and your own family dynamics. If you need an extra copy, I got first, second, and third weeks. They're over there on the counter. You're welcome to help yourself there if you've missed one of them. And that, plus, they're also on Central Hub YouTube. Well, tonight we're on the last one, putting it all together, five keys to um, successful parenting, and all sessions can be found on the YouTube. Have any of you looked at them yet? Does it come... Does, can, do I come through all right, Bob? Okay, I, I, I just thought it was kind of a cure for insomnia. So you just... <laughs> you know. Anyway, all sessions... Good how bad you need the there, there you go. <laughs> uh, all right, you've seen this many times. This is the end goal. All of these, this, your mission statement that you make should have a reflection that this is where you want to get to. Um, the, all of these have really good research support behind them as if your child demonstrates these traits and qualities, he or she will be successful um, in life. Then we talked about the four parenting styles. Um, hopefully you've been able to kind of analyze what yours is. Just a quick review. The best one is what we call the democratic or the authoritative. Um, overall, but you've got to use all of three of them, all right? Not the neglectful, of course, but the permissive one would be used in adolescence more likely, and then the others uh, go back and forth. There's my family, and so I, I just want a quick review. Discipline versus punishment. Discipline is to disciple, to train, to mentor, to encourage, um, to teach. Whereas punishment is, you are inflicting uh, pain consequences to a violation of some law, some sort of edict, some sort of principle, and a code. And, and that's, it's really about a legal issue when you talk about punishment. In the Old Testament and New Testament, there is no direct reference to children should be punished. There's just no way. And I, last week, if you want further insight into that, I gave a link to, to an a, a article in a magazine that really does a good job of exploring the Hebrew and the Greek terms for that. So discipline punishment does not apply to training children. The thing about punishment is it doesn't tell you what is the appropriate behavior or what should be. It, it, doesn't, it just says that was wrong. Don't do that. But it doesn't kind of redirect, okay, what should I do then in, in place? Uh, biblical uh, discipline, it's coaching, discipling, using the Word of God. I mean, that's, that's basically it. It's using the precepts, the principles of, of Scripture, of God, and applying it to your family. And so it involves instructing, admonition, correcting, um, reproving, and modeling. It conveys, well, the idea here is you're trying to get a sense of teaching the child you are a moral being. 
And how do we get you prepared to be a moral being? That there is moral fault, and from a biblical divine perspective, there's an element of judgment on how we live our lives. And there are, and the Bible is real clear that God has some standards that we're supposed to obey to demonstrate that, that love and commitment to His kingdom. So this is, and what's interesting, if you go into Proverbs, discipline in Proverbs, the outcome of that is moral integrity, honesty, truthfulness, self-control, productivity, generosity, piety, and independence. Those are the byproducts of discipling um, children uh, in the Old Testament. So this is a quick review of last week. About six things, seven things I want to share here. I know you've seen this, but I just I want to come back to it because it's the context of what we did last week. You got to lead with love. Goes without saying. Um, understanding how to love your children. Um, do what's best for the child without losing your personhood or your authority or your authority. Um, two key needs that you have to work on in fostering is significance and a sense of belonging. I'll say that again. Having worth and value and feeling connected. If those two criteria are met within your children, it goes a long ways in terms of how you can discipline and disciple them. Please differentiate, and you're going to see this throughout presentation tonight. To avoid shame, you differentiate between, or toxic shame, between the behavior and the person. I said that last week. You don't say good job. Good, well, I would say a good job because you're putting the adjective on the behavior. But you're a good boy, bad boy, bad girl, but we just don't, that just does not help in conveying a sense of what I would say non-shaming discipline, parenting. So never use the phrase good or bad boy or girl. We'll talk about this natural and logical consequence is literally the best way overall of disciplining. Because then you're connecting the activity with consequences and outcome that make logical sense in what, what is going on within the child. Um, again, I like the title. Discipline to Disciple. Uh, yes. Have regular family meetings where the five rules are discussed for each child. Each child should have his or her own rules. Some can be, oh, there could be overlap, of course. If you've got one that says, we don't lie, and, and so that would be across the board what that looks like. I, I love the idea of posting it, signing it, getting involved, investment in it, have the kids buy in. Yes, okay, what five rules do you want to live by? And so he or she chooses, these are the ones. Okay, let's determine the consequences, and they have involvement in that. So when they do violate the rule, then you say, wait a minute, don't blame me. This is what you agreed to. And so what are you doing with that? You're internalizing the behavior. You take responsibility for your behavior and your actions because you agreed to do this. Um, this. This one you don't hear a lot about in the literature, but I want my, I did want my kids to be afraid of me. I wasn't trying to be their best friend. I was going to be their dad, but I had a role and responsibility to raise them in the love and nurture of the Lord and to prepare them for life. And I'm not, I didn't want to be their buddy. I mean, I am their buddy now, but not while they are under my roof. And I want them to have that sense of fear because they're, they're, think about your relationship with the Lord. To me, discipling is getting them ready to have a relationship in this world and with, with God. There are certain things that you know you love the Lord and you know the Lord loves you, but there are things we are afraid of Him at times. Especially, when are we, should we be afraid of the Lord? When we sin, that, that should be a barrier. I'm not going to do that because I'm afraid the Lord will get really upset with me. And so I want my kids to, when they're away at someone else, no, I don't want to do this because I'm afraid what mom's going to do. I'm afraid what dad's going to do. I'm okay with that. And you do that in the context of what? Love, significance, and belonging. So regardless, I want them to have a view of God and then also a sense of how he sees our behavior. 
Okay, this is the last slide on kind of a review here. Three keys to foster toxic shame in children. And I, I go back, why am I focused on shame? Because it is a force of Satan. I'll just, uh, Kurt Thompson, Soul of Shame. It is destructive. Toxic shame destroys that which is beautiful. It keeps, it breaks relationships. Um, and if the Lord, if somehow we have a, a negative view of ourselves, Satan is thrilled because then it inhibits us from being what he wants us to be or doing what he wants us to do. So that's why I'm focusing on this. We also know that toxic shame is a core ingredient of so many different mental illnesses and disorders. I, two, about three weeks ago, remember that whole list of all the mental illnesses associated with toxic shame. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, that's why the title, Parenting Without Shaming, because if, if your child feels shameful, if your child feels inadequate, inferior, flawed, defective, then he or she is going to try to compensate for that at some way, some other purpose beyond, usually it's not in a healthy way. So three keys to foster toxic shame, punishment, criticism, and... Ridicule. We're going to have some real specific ones uh, a little bit later on. We can also create shame by ridiculing kids for their feelings or their actions or by making them feel that something about them is not good enough. You... Comments or questions anytime, please jump in there. All right. Please jump in there. So again, punishment, criticism and ridicule fosters toxic shame. There is mild, healthy shame. All right, All right. I'm not going to, I, I just put this here where there is healthy shame and healthy guilt, and I, I want to just point this out here. Purpose of healthy shame, you develop a conscience. I want that internal conscience to say, Grant, you shouldn't do this. That's not good. That's going to hurt somebody. That's going to hurt you. Don't do that. I don't want someone having to tell me what to do or not to do. It has to come, it has to be internalized. Purpose of healthy shame is take responsibility for the behavior. It helps rein in our impulses so we can stay safe, live with others, and attain our goals. And it is critical for self-regulation. We must learn about the social rules. How do we do that? We're aware that my behavior may offend or hurt or someone, and I want to know I, I don't want to do that. Because if you don't care about other people, then you're rather selfish, and you're not going to learn how to regulate how to interact with other people. And the, the problem with toxic shame is now the problem is the person, not the behavior. I will say that again. When you discipline, focus on what? The behavior and not the individual, not the, purpose, uh, uh, the, the person, him or herself. So now, if I feel like I'm flawed, defective, tainted, defiled, how do I correct that? How do I change that? If my own parents see me that way, now what do I do? How do I treat that? Um, and there's different one to try perfectionism and being the best at everything. And if that doesn't work, then what do you do? Then you go into numbing and deviant behavior or connecting with some other entity or individual that gives you some worth and significance that oftentimes is not a healthy. It's where gangs are very powerful because they give what? Belonging and significance. But this is the key. It's, I'm a bad person. I'm a bad kid. Now, I am assuming all of us in here at one time or another thought we were a bad kid. <laughs> Correct? That that's, I don't want to pathologize that. That can be part of a normal thing. But then that's where parents come in and start trying to encourage that, refute that, negate that type of thinking. So let's talk about some shaming phrases. All right. See if uh, how could you be so stupid, so dumb? What's wrong with you? Of course, no one ever heard that, right, from your own folks. 
When will you ever get it right? When will you ever listen to us? And what I want you to do, when I put all these down, I want you to say, what, what, what's the common denominator underneath these that creates the shame? You know better than that. That's not what Joneses do. Yeah, we said that a time or two. Must I do everything for you? You'd lose your head if it wasn't glued on. Are you a baby? You're such a bad boy. You don't feel that way. You're making it a bigger deal than it really is. Why can't you be like your sister? She gives us no problems. If you were a real Christian, you wouldn't do that. Die. Which That's one? Not what Joneses do. I mean, isn't that setting a standard that they are going to want to live up to? I want... Evidently it's wrong because he says it's wrong. Well, no, I, I just... The, the issue that I'm trying to do in that is there, it, it's you. The focus is on you, not your behavior. That's... Your behavior... And you, because of that, is creating some difficulty. It's embarrassing the family. And it's not about you, it's about us. And I, and I know there's shame cultures, absolutely. And that's a big deal. But saying that's not what Joneses do, that's making that kid a part of... The, our Joneses. community, that is correct, yes. And it's just saying, we don't act like that. Okay. We like being Joneses. <laughs> I always wanted to be a Joneses. <laughs> I, I, Okay, I'm going to circle back to that, Di. Thank you for raising that, because I want to circle back to that. Yeah, all right? I'm going to give you a free pass here. I appreciate that. I really do. What's, what are some common denominators here that make these shaming phrases? The word you. You. That's number one. Pardon? Some of them are comparisons. Comparisons. Uh, and and can you explain that a little bit, or go, uh, kind of expand upon that? Why can't you live like your sister? Yeah. And, and what's the problem with that? They idealize her that she's never made a mistake, but and she, I'm sure she has. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the, the what's the the whoever, conclusion of that? Whoever they're talking to is not as good as the other. Right. You're not good enough. Who you are is not good enough. Good. What else do you see here? Name calling. Name calling. Absolutely. Ridiculing. Putting down. Putting down. Absolutely. What's the problem there? Not allowing them to feel what they feel. Correct. You're pathologizing normal feelings. There's a time where, where I just thought anger was sin. So I'm trying not to be angry. Good luck with that one. And it took me a while to rest. Okay, wait a minute. In your anger, don't sin. And so it just, there are those, when I realized that there are fundamental emotions that are just there, it really helped me with this, to normalize that's. And do, do many of you have maybe have multiple, more than one child, but it's amazing how they feel differently. The same experience, but their intensity of that same, that, or that anger or the sadness is different. Why? Because each of them have a different perceptual set, a different lens, and it goes through their lens. Anything else on here? Right. It, Also, I find in my own life, it's not necessarily what you say, it is how you say it. Correct. You have an, you have an edge on your voice, you're yelling. The tone. And if you bring it down a notch, 
make it sound like regular conversation. Mm -hmm. Still, those phrases are not correct, but you take a lot of the meaning out of the pipe mm -hmm. yeah. by using the, the right tone. Um, at least that's what I see. I agree with you. The delivery of yeah. the words. Uh, I can still, I can be angry with what my son has done and communicate that anger and that disappointment and, it's, and be in a voice like this. Or say, son, I, I'm, I'm hurt by this. this. This really angers me that you would consider that that's okay behavior for you. Because Joneses don't do that. <laughs> You, see, the problem here is if, if, if you shame, the, I want, there's clearly no doubt that Jones, all of you have cultures. There, there is no doubt that you, <laughs> this is what the Joneses do. But the problem is, I, don't want to, I want to make sure his behavior is what the issue is and not the fact that he's my son. That, that I just want to make clear that your behavior isn't what the Joneses do. But you're a Jones, and we're going to work on that. So I, I agree with Di in the sense of this could go either way. Uh, so to some extent, you can kind of break, uh, break their spirit to where they think I'm broken, and yeah. I, don't, I don't fit with everyone yeah. else. Correct. It, it, and again, it goes back to one of the things, the sense of belonging. And if you have this communication, you don't, you're not good enough to be one of us could really create some really difficult discipline times. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me ask you, what are, from your perspective, what do you remember being a shaming phrase or that maybe you experienced or, what, please. I remember from, I can, I can see where I was in my mind sitting in my room at my desk doing homework. And I had a candle lit. And I don't know, I, I was probably like t 11 years old. Mm. And the candle was too close to the wall. And the, the, fl the, the flame was, there was like a, a wisp that was like making the wall gray. Yes. And my mom walks in and I remember the look on her face and she telling me how stupid I was. Mm. But it was just like, I can't erase it. No. Like it has, like it hurts me. Yeah, just like thinking today, of, yeah. I can see the look on her face. I can see the look of disgust. Yeah. And I just think, oh, Lord, I just don't want to do that <laughs> to my mom. Yeah. You know, I love my mom dearly. <laughs> yes. But I just, I, rem I just remember, I Those can't statements. erase that from, from my memory. Yeah. So in, again, you see where the focus is on you as a person, not as your behavior. And it's real easy to do that. Anyone else? A shaming phrase that stands out to you. Uh, I think the first time I got arrested, uh, <laughs> my uh, dad was a cop, which was not good. Uh, <laughs> I was sitting there for waiting for him to come and get me, and he fined me and made me feel, well, called me an idiot. That will never go, um, that'll never leave my mind. I mean, okay, I screwed up. I yeah. understand. But uh, I thought there were better ways. Now that I'm grown, I think there were better ways to handle it than yeah. the way he did. But he had a hot temper. Mm -hmm. And so... And he po is probably dealing with his sense of shame or humiliation that my own son Absolutely. is there and he couldn't put that aside to see what was best for you. That's the hard part about parenting. If you carry your own wounds and shame, it's hard to put that aside to do what's best for your child because you will personalize it then. Instead of recognizing that child has free will and not everything he or she does is a reflection of me, even though we can think that. But yeah, that's, that's where that toxic shame, our own hurt or can be projected on our children unless we have a really good sense of that. Rita. I think as a parent, and then I'm thinking about your mom too, the children don't realize 
what's going through the mind of a parent, but sometimes as parents, I think, I think a lot of times as uh, mothers, if we see that our child is in danger, like mm -hmm. maybe the house breaking, mm -hmm. we react out of fear mm -hmm. and we say something we don't really mean. Really mean, yeah. yep. But the child takes the it child does, takes it personally, yeah. Mm -hmm. Parenting really isn't for cowards. To do it correctly. Absolutely. And yet, one more. Can you think of a shaming phrase? I'll throw one out there. When our children do not perform well academically, how, how do you respond to that? You get the grade card, and there is a, what, a single leg A there, and <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it? So you wouldn't say, I know you are better than this. You would say, I know you have better abilities than this? I think I would, yeah, or well, I, I, I would, no. How do you separate? I'm going to say, okay, we, we, we need to talk about this, son. Help me understand how we got here. So I'm going to clarify and figure out wh what happened before I start coming up with a solution. I, I think the real tough one for that is if they do actually work hard yes. and fail, that's different than Clearly. if they just slack off. And didn't try. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. So you have to really know. And I think that's all of us have to understand what is, what is the capability of our kids. We have to figure that out, what he or she um, is capable of doing. And it wasn't fair to my boys because I had tested them for their IQ for my program. <laughs> so it's like, oh, we're screwed, you know. <laughs> yeah, you were in wings and you were almost in wings, so we know what you can do. Correct? So I just, anyway, that was, so we just had to let that go. We, we, and so we, but there were times, where, okay, you're responsible for your, that was a hard one, especially once I got high school. We just had to let them take point and take ownership for, for their academics. Now, we didn't have to struggle with someone that doesn't do well, and that's, for those of you that have someone maybe on the spectrum, or they're, they're not as gifted academically, that's, Please, try. that's a hard thing to do. We've got to come alongside, get him the resources, the coaching, the aids, whatever it takes to help him or her be successful in the classroom because there's so much identity attached to classroom behavior and performance, and especially during this COVID stuff. Oh, my. I have a set of twins, and they do. They compare themselves. They're six, and it's so hard to, like, tell them you are your own person. Yes. You don't have to be as good. A different, yes. Like, it's very challenging. Yeah. To one another, or to their older sibling, or yeah. Are they are they identical? Mm -hmm. Oh boy. It's yeah. Even. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah. Uh, that's tough. Yeah. yeah. And it's true. If you have children, one or more academically gifted than another one, or more gifted athletically or musically that natural propensity is to compare and that's where we as parents have got to step in and try to f and sort that out. Who you are is, is special, unique. You're one of a kind. Great. All right, let me go on because I want to get to some Q&A at the end here. All right, so here's, here's this is just an, a, a model that is there. I put some stuff together. It's kind of five points. Some of this is already embedded with some previous presentations, but the rules and standards by which you want your children to live by must be clearly stated, clearly understood, and make sense. Children must have boundaries. Children by themselves do not learn boundaries on their own. They're always testing the limits, and we as parents have to establish those boundaries. And so, they have to be justified, they have to make sense. And this was the one that always got me when growing up. Well, why do we do it that way? Well, I don't know, just because I said so. 
Okay, how does that help me? And so with our boys who are kind of smart, it had to make sense. Dad, why, why are we doing that? It doesn't make sense. Okay, let's talk about it then. And so then we would make sure that whatever rules we had um, were justifiable, made sense. And so I like this. So this, this is an interesting phrase that I, came, or, uh, that I discovered a while back. We must set empathetic limits. What does that sound like to you besides a bunch of goggly goop? Right. So, and I, I agree with what you're saying in the sense of, okay, these are limits, but we understand there are times when they're going to be violated and we're going to show some empathy and understanding when that happens. We're not going to take away the consequences, but there's going to be an understanding of, we understand why you did that or how that happened. But we still are going to, I know you didn't feel well, I know your brother said some nasty things to you, but that still does not justify what you did. And so we have to work on that. But yes, I understand what you, <laughs> we had to pull the brothers off each other from time to time. And that was challenging. Because they were hugging each other. <laughs> <laughs> Involve the children, get buy-in, have ownership. I, I just, and oh, one more thing uh, add, add to this clearly identify what the consequences is when they agree, when they violate it, and then also what when they obey it. So their rewards if they follow through with it, and then their consequences if they don't. We, we tied in um, their allowances to a certain degree on some of these uh, from time to time. Um, and, and I'm don't have time to talk about how we manage money, but you've got to give kids a chance to manage their money. Um, they, they won't learn it unless we teach them. But uh, it should be tied to their behavior to a certain degree. There's X amount you get because you're our son, and here's X amount that you can get if you do X, Y, Z. And if you don't do it and mom has to do it, then mom gets to keep the money because you're paying her uh, to do that, or me. I kept. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Compounded interest is pretty large right now. Uh, any questions on this? Have any of you tried to do this yet in the last couple, three weeks? How, how's it going? Yes. So we had to that one in. Okay. And it's, if it's something that they're not accustomed to, it's going to take a while to get used to that. And after a while, I think you'll see it just it flows. And then when they know that they really have influence as to what works and doesn't work, it really can make a difference in their investment um, in the family, being a part of it. Oh, that's different. So, like, yeah. <laughs> just simple things like love others or We don't hit. Yeah. No. Um, we don't bite. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't throw food. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's gotta be age appropriate. Yeah. Great point. I didn't know if it was realistic to like set. Well, I I, I I think I probably start this around first grade. Okay. Yeah. When they can read, write, and be part of that process. Oh, 
Um, it, it would be, and I, I'll, well, I'll just do it now. When the children do what we want them to do, we praise them. Which is verbal praise. Verbal praise, and I have no problem, you know, especially if he or she is not doing it to get the reward. They're already, and they, they've done it, and, and you obey, you honored me the first time, son. I appreciate that. Hey, let's go get an Andy's. I have no problem with that, because why? Did he do the behavior to get Andy's? No. It's an informative reward. It's not a controlling reward. So there could be, let me get you some drink or something, but it doesn't have to be that big. But, but the praise is a reward. Thank you, son. I really appreciate that. And, and be creative in that, yes. Yes. The biggest motivator for them is screen time. Yes. So they have morning routine, afternoon routine, evening routine, and if they need a bonus, they, they earn 15 minutes for each of those. I love that. And they do a couple bonuses for an extra 15 minutes. So they do that, they do each of those and they earn it for the next day, but if they violate the rules, they can let, lose 15 minutes at a time. Correct. So um, we don't word it like it's a punishment, although technically you could. Consequence. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're unearning it, yes. basically. So in order to earn that screen time, they need to do those chores and have a good attitude, not break the rules. I love it. They're earning their screen time. Right. I, screen time is a big motivator. And I'll get to that a little later on. Find something that the kids don't want to give up as your leverage for, as a consequence. I know it sounds awkward and weird, but try it. It does work. It does work. And you, it, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be right that right off the get-go. You're going to have to renegotiate and everything. But if you let the kids know, your teens know, we want you involved in creating this family and what works for you. And, and I want to come alongside you to help you. Uh, respect. There's... Uh, colleague of mine, Dr. Jeff Sutton, wrote a book, Parenting with Respect. Um, the whole book is on that, and, and it just shows you how powerful that can be. Uh, and, and so, it requires an attitudinal shift on our parts to not just see this as a baby or as a child that, praise God, someday is going to become an adult, but it's more, that is a human being with a soul. That, 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 that I am instructed to raise for the kingdom of God. And I have to show that respect. This child is not just something that I can demand, go do this, do that. Do, you know, it, it's a person that God, through Jesus, died for. So this is, to me, parents must be willing to show the same respect they require from their children. And by that means, watch what I say, how I say it, the tone, the mannerisms. Because if I'm yelling and screaming at him, I, and then he does the same thing back to me, we have not, that's not with respect. Parents should never belittle, embarrass the child in front of other peers. Hmm. Um, a child should know that his parents really do care about me. Protect, guide, speak, honor but respect. You are a human being, and I, your personality, your gifts and abilities are a gift from God. And how can I, I want to come alongside you, son, and develop those gifts for the kingdom. And I try to use that a lot. You're a gift from God. God has a pl plan and a purpose for your life, and I'm going to help you develop your giftings and your skills so that you can be the person the Lord wants you to be. Discipline should be an act of love. Doing what's best for the child and in the context of what you want your child to be as an adult. When we discipline, that is an act of love. It's hard to imagine that, isn't it? Because it's doing what's best for the child. Communication is critical during this time. I remember 
um, my parents doing this, and, and we tried to do it when there was conflict. It was, okay, go to your room, son. I'll be there in 10, 15 minutes. Why? Exactly. My sympathetic nervous system, highly activated, I am not in a good mood, I'm not in good spirit, I am very upset and angry. That is not the time to con communicate with my son. So I give myself at least 30 minutes so the parasympathetic nervous system can reset. calm down, yeah, reset. And so if it's a really emotional thing and you know you're el escalating and it's not going well, just say, son, daughter, go to your room and we're going to cool off. And then we'll come back and talk about this. But communication is clearly, I messages, please, go last week, Look at some of the examples of how to do eye messages. They are very effective, very effective in trying to communicate not only your displeasure, but your hurt and how it's impacted you. It also helps put in there that toxic shame, that mild shame that we, not the toxic, excuse me, put in the mild shame that can be very good in helping their, develop their conscience. Parents should not dread or avoid this type of confrontation, but use it as teachable moments. Son, let's talk about this. Let me understand. Before, I wish I had been a psychologist long before I became a parent. Because it's like, I, I, I naturally do. Okay, help me understand what happened this week in your life. Where did this come from? How did this start? And with our kids, do we do that? What's the context of their behavior? I want to know, where did it come from? What's going on? Are you hurt? Are you scared? Something bad happened at school to where you're just projecting that. Or, so communication. So using I messages, please focus on what again? The behaviors. Don't ignore them and focus on how the behaviors impact you. Know what is the underlying motivation for the misbehavior. Is it due to lack of attention? Needing power? Seeking revenge? or displaying inadequacy. That's the step. Systematic training for effective parenting. Misbehavior has some roots. Let's find out what that misbehavior is and then you can make an appropriate intervention. With teens, we got four more. Excitement, comfort, escape, or peer acceptance. If we know what those are about, then we can make the appropriate an intervention that may be more fitting with what he or she is struggling with. What is the underlying cause? As a disciplinary strategy, use natural logical consequences. And I'll get to the next line here about pain. So what do we mean by natural logical consequences? So if the screen time interferes with their ability to study or to get their task done, then we say, all right, what are you going to do? What are we going to do about that? We're going to take the screen away. It, it's, um, so we, we make it, and what we used to do, if they wake up cranky or have difficulty getting to school, then that means they were? Up too late, yes, too tired. We use that one a lot, as I've already shared. So when they're cranky with each other or mean to each other, wow, boys, I bet you if you got enough sleep, you wouldn't be that mean to each other, so we'll just go to bed earlier tonight and, and make the connection between the behavior and the consequence. It, it needs to be logical uh, as best as you can. I'm trying to think, of, um, oh, if if kid or child has problems uh, in Sunday school, okay, what do you do with that? I know it never happened to you, but <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that it, you must be bored in there or something, and you're trying to create attention. So come sit with us, and we'll make it really boring for you. And so. They would rather be with you? Yes. Well, then that's a different ball game because maybe they're acting up to be with you. So again, that's we're, what's we're the... We're with each other all day long. <laughs> yeah. 
And you, and you and that's why you come to church is get rid of the kids. <laughs> yes, I understand that. I, I literally had to jump over a fence to, to get, run away from them. <laughs> well, the, gate, oh. the baby gate. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> Dart. Dart. How old are you? are talking about the two and, four. two and four. Okay, you got some separation anxiety stuff with the two year old. I long, though. Yeah, well, I, I'm <laughs> understand. That's that age development. The four year old, I would say, okay, well, that's another Maybe issue. Yeah, he's, that's a tough one. The, the four-year-old four year old starts it, and then the two-year-old just follows. Follow suit, yes. And are they in two different programs, aren't they? Well, no, that's the thing. They, they two-year-olds and four-year-olds. That they wanted to stay together, so we allowed them to stay together. Uh, no more. Okay. No more. So let them go it's, e exactly. That's not working, is it? All right, so there you go. So we're, we are changing away. We're not going to do what we normally do. We're going to try something else. Absolutely. Um, and, and they're not trying to be defiant. If they were trying to be defiant, that would be a different story, too. They're just kids. trying to. And, they, and I would find out, what is the four-year-old afraid of? Is he concerned about what bad thing may happen? And then I would say, okay, if you can stay... I tell you what, and this is where rewards work. If you can stay here without crying, what would you like to do? What would be a good reward, some in incentive? I believe in incentives to establish the behavior first. Once the behavior is established, then we remove the incentives and go to praise or something like that. But son, what would you love to do? And is that like during the tantrum or talk about it before we... No, you do it before you get there. Son, we're going to church today. If you will go to your class, not be clingy, not throw a temper tantrum, then afterwards we will go do something very special that he wants to do or it would be powerful for him to do. I just And, and see what would he would like to do. What would you like to do if you uh, went through without throwing a temper tantrum? But the two-year-old, I wouldn't worry about that if that was the case. But. But I would not put him in the same group. No, 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 no. No, no, that, that's me. But Rita would put him in the same group because she has, <laughs> she has a bigger heart than me. They, were, they would go fine together. Yeah. They would go right in, and I wouldn't have to sit there and wait until they were too distracted. But now it's, now that I, they want me to sit there. Yeah, I'm like, I have to go to class. That's I have class, you have class. And that's where separate and then work out some agreement for the four-year-old. Okay. That's what I would do. But that, that's tough. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if there was just a simple, straightforward parenting plan for all our kids? Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, it would be great. Grant will be down there next week to help. There, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the discipline must be painful in order for change in behavior. I, I, and it, pain is varies. One of our boys... Spanking did nothing. The other, it did. Other taking, making go to bed early was like the worst thing ever, or something like that. So it, it varies, and, and no TV or screen time. Or, um, I, I, it has to hurt. You don't want to hurt too much, of course, but if it doesn't hurt, it's not going to be mod, it's not going to modify behavior. Um, what is important to the child, and use that as a deterrent or as a reward. Um, timeouts. Timeouts are a big deal for everybody. It seems like how many? Who has not used a timeout? Okay. Timeouts only work if it's painful. And I don't know how effective. I mean, it just to me, timeouts just can work. Can I, but it, a lot of people use it, and I'm okay with that. Uh, loss of toys or screen time, earlier bedtime, being grounded, uh, loss of the car. Uh, Our boys would hate it if they were made to take the bus to school. school. Oh, yeah. And we grounded them from the car. That was it's like worse for them. <laughs> Even fines if they have an allowance. Um, extra chores, I'm not in favor of that, but... It still could be that way. It, it's like, what's the connection between the misdeed and 
the chores. Now, we used to use chores to get their money back if they'd lost some. Um, so it's like, okay, you could work that back and, and get that money if you wanted to. Uh, this is another one of those things that, that doesn't get circulated much in the profession. We must never give up our authority as parents. Never. And I'm seeing that in schools. If the kids don't respect teachers, you wonder, do they really respect their parents? Um, any acts of defiance and rebellion must be disciplined. That's non-negotiable. I even put their parents got to go to the mat on this. Even if what? You need professional help. We had, we knew our boys were going to be taller than both Rita and I. You want to find out the height of your child at age two, whatever it was, double that. And there's a good chance he or she will be that height. So we, and of course, I'm doing that with my boys. Right at two, birthday measured. Okay, we got it. Ryan was three foot two inches, and he's 6'4". Cameron was just a little bit over th uh, three feet, and he's 6'2", 6'3". And so during middle school, well, actually before middle school, they're, they're getting tall, and they're getting normal. See, the thing is, if you have, if you have healthy kids, they're going to be more what? Act, vocal and active and engaging, because they have, and I knew that if they, if Rita didn't find a way to establish what? Authority, they were just going to bowl her over. And I wasn't going to be the one that always was going to be the bad guy. So we strategized, and they, we talk about this to this day. It, it, is, it was one of the most brilliant things we ever did. Boys never forgot it. They never it. forgot it. And, and you can, to this, to this day, yes. And because they would give her grief, they would sass her. They wouldn't do their work. They took advantage of her. And I said, okay, Rita, here's what we're going to do. Tonight, when they do their normal stupid stuff, you are going to say, okay, that's it. I'm going on strike. I am not going to be your mom. You're done. I will not get you up to go to school. I will not fix your meals. I will not do your laundry. I will not check on you if you've gone to bed or not. They were at five or, or fifth grade, sixth grade and third grade or somewhere in there. Third and, and, and so you, and, we're, and we're, you're done. If you don't care about us, well then, you're on your own. Okay, how many would be willing to do that? <laughs> Scary. It was. So, and we had a plan, so Rita had this gourmet meal already planned for her and I. <laughs> oh, so there was, and the, at the table, and... No, we did it before too. Every we had it each night, and so we and so the boys would come and walk in and walk by this beautiful spread and We'd smile. Smile. That. <laughs> it was it was wonderful. They go, they go to the fridge. <laughs> Make, pretty good over there, but make they PBJ five. sandwiches or something like. Ah, uh, I don't think it went quite that long. Well. when I made the really nice dinner and the dessert and everything, and they were acting like maybe we want to get into mom's graces again. And they were just kind of hanging out. And I Upstairs, said, yep. I said, boys, are you, have you thought about this? Are you wanting to know how to get mom's health again? And they go, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I had made a list, I think 10 things. Mm -hmm. And we went over them all, and they had to sign that they would. And it really made a huge difference. It really did. It was. It and to this day, they <laughs> say, Mom, and here they are, 36 and almost 39. And they'll say, Mom, we know you never loved us. You went on strike. The one thing I regret <laughs> that I almost did, because they'd come home on the bus, yes. that would stop right in front of our house. I so 
thought of this and I didn't do it, but I was going to make a sign. Placard. Yeah. And be pacing up and down the <laughs> sidewalk saying, Mom on That's stress. right, that's right. But I was a little afraid I might get reported. <laughs> <laughs> Must establish your authority. And it starts young. Got to start young. Um, so, I, I, I want to, this is where I was, okay, I'm going to do, okay, let, I'm going to do this, all right? Behavioral therapy, to change behavior, you have two options. You either increase the behavior or you stop the behavior. All right, so, I'm going to put something up here, and I, I, the reason I want you to understand this is because it does really help you begin to know, is this a behavior that I want to continue? Then this is what I can do to help it. And if this is a behavior I don't want to continue, this is what I can do to prevent it. So on this chart here, um, this is um, outcome, whether it's positive or negative. And then this is action. Do I add something or do I remove something? Okay. If a child does a behavior that we want him or her to do and then we reward it, we call that what? Positive reinforcement. So he or she cleans up the room, well done, bunga. Here, let's, let's go do this fun event at the park. All right. Praise can be this as well. So you, they do the behavior and then you praise, you reward, you give some positive outcome. All right. How many of you like headaches? When you have a headache, what do you look to do? Get rid of it. And you try to find something to do to get rid of it. So in that situation, you do a behavior to remove something that's aversive or painful. So that is called what? Negative reinforcement. So if I have a headache, I go exercise, it goes away, guess what I'm going to do next time I have a headache? I'll probably go exercise. If the exercise doesn't work and then I go to an Advil and that doesn't work, then I go to two Advils and that works. The next time I get a headache, I'm going to use the whole bottle. The whole bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go, so the, it's reinforcement because what behavior is being reinforced? The behavior that gets rid of the pain. Okay. So, one of the things with step parenting is kids act out because they're not getting enough attention. So they don't get the positive attention by cleaning their room, obeying you, and so they do what? They act out. Or, yeah, and so then you, when they act out, they're mean or bully or nasty or break something, and then you give them attention, what have you just done? You have reinforced negative, negative behavior, painful behavior, inadvertently. It, it's, and so the, so the next time the child is like, okay, I'm not getting enough attention, I'll just do what? I'll do something stupid and then negative attention is better than no attention. How many of you, you'll ask your child first time, do something, they don't do it, then you raise your voice, they don't do it, you raise your voice a third time and then what happens? That's when you go ballistic and then he or she then does the behavior. But they know, 
I don't have to, I can wait until that tone gets a certain level and then I, that's when she means business or he means business. You have just done what? Reinforced going up the ladder before he or she kicks in. Right. So, what, I'm just saying, be careful. What you inadvert, that's why when your kid acts out in the grocery store, I don't want to reinforce that. I say, I'm going to take, what am I going to do? Yay, look over here, Oscar, look at my child, acting like some sort of clown at a circus. <laughs> and what do you do? Take away the reinforcing value that may be there. So these two are the only ways, according to behavioral therapy, in which you can change behavior. To add behavior. That's what I mean by reinforcement. These two here now are to eliminate behavior. So when I add something painful, what do we call that? Punishment. Punishment. Yep. Yep. Correct. So I'm talking about punishment, I'm enforcing some, they do the behavior, I give something negative, and we hope that the behavior stops. Over here, where I remove something positive, where I don't give reinforcement to it, we call that extinction. This is when your kid is acting up in a grocery store, and what do you do? Ignore it. That's what this is. Ignore. Don't pay any attention to it. These are the two ways in which you do what? Stop a behavior. So when I am parenting, in developing rules and consequences, I'm looking for this and I'm looking for that with their permission and the agreement and then I'm very careful about what I negatively reinforce. That's inadvertent. And then here I try to say, okay, I'm not going to pay attention to that. It's no big deal. I'm not going to get involved in that so he or she then doesn't get any benefit from a reaction from me. Say that again? Oh, that one, because yeah, I could ignore it, move on, but I wanted to do a paradoxical injunction. So it's, it's a fancy word to take the reinforcing out of it and not ignore it, but what I'm bringing more attention to it, but in a different way. So I know that's not the same thing. You could walk away, but the problem is the kid's still there, you walk away, and they're still yelling and screaming, and then all the, what, security people or whatever, <laughs> say, and the, the kids want to pick up on it. Because our boys, a couple times, say, we're going to hotline you, Mom and Dad. So, okay, here's the phone. Go ahead. Call them on their bluffs. Okay? Because they were smart, and they're trying to do what? Like send them out the door to run away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. To foster intrinsic motivation, catch them in the act, give the reward without them knowing that they just got a reward. Tonight, when you go home, you see, and they've done something that's beautiful and that you have, it's just voluntarily done, praise the snot out of them. Make it a big deal. Especially if they have a hard time doing a certain behavior. Um, spontaneously reward, praise the child when the desired behavior occurs. Use incentives to establish the desired behavior and then switch to rewards. Or I mean praise, excuse me. Here's my last one. Be preemptive. Please foster family times. Do your children, with what's going on in your lives now, do they believe they are an important part of your family? Do they know that significant resources and energies have been committed to them? And if they have, keep it up. If they haven't, start. It, it, it just, and I'm going to just, uh, some good research. This is a thing of the past, suppers together. If you're not doing suppers together, I really want you to reconsider that. That family time at supper was some of the best discussions we ever had. Oh. Every, and we had this rule. 
Everything's fair game at the table. When we're at supper, it's fair game. You can bring up anything. I love that. Devotions together. If you're doing devotions together. If you have kids in elementary, Dan and Louie tapes. Have you ever heard of those? It's, um, used to be on Revival, or no, Bets or Demets. It's him and his puppet. And they, they, you plug them in at night and they go to bed listening to Dan and Louie tapes and their Bible stories. Amazing stuff. And so that they would fall asleep, but they would be falling asleep to a Bible story. Start your traditions. Please go to church. Okay? And, and I don't, I mean, that's just, that's, that's what we do as a family. Um, they must know beyond a shadow of doubt that they are loved, valued, valued wanted. and wanted, desired, significant, special. And then my last slide here, I want to, I just, okay, here, I'm just putting these up here. This is the best resource on sex education, bar none, through Concordia Publishing House, learning about sex. It is amazing stuff. It's for every age group. They have a book for each group or download, whatever. We bought these for our boys every age. We got another one. They put it by their bedside. And one of the neat things was, then the neighborhood boys would come in and read. And that was good to me, too, because they were getting trained. Um, so I, I just I want you to know there's the website. Um, can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. And then the step parenting program. There is the uh, website. And then I mentioned last week how we love our kids, the five styles of parenting. Good, good stuff. Absolutely good stuff. Hallelujah. So all of you now, if you've been to all four, or you've listened to all four, then you will be a greater parent for the rest of your life because you've had the minimum of three one and a half hour sessions and, and you're going to be awesome parents. And of course you're going to be perfect, right? You're not going to make mistakes and you will never fail and because, right, absolutely right. <laughs> That is extremely toughy, absolutely, especially when it comes to the authority issue. Who has the authority? But. You just have to take out the section on discipline and then everything else. <laughs> 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 yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Pastor Wanamaker had a saying, and I wish I could remember. You remember what he said? There's nothing like the taillights of your kids leaving with the grandkids. I mean, there's a sense of there was a great time, but but even greater when you saw the taillights leaving. And <laughs> uh, all right. Let's, let's close in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to help us be the parents you want us to be. Give us a love for our children that just transcends our own understanding and our own humanity. I, I pray your Holy Spirit, Lord, will give wisdom to recognize each child needs to be treated differently because each child is different, even the twins. And I just thank you for members that are here today that you will bless them, anoint them, and guide them in ways that just, that just freaks them out, transcends their understanding. And um, I pray that they will continue to pursue parenting truths. And we'll give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Amen. Amen.